here I am. <laughs> I say that because I was just kind of, I'm surprised. Um, I was at a men's retreat and got back late last night, so I'm running on about four hours of sleep, but I am, I've made it, and uh, I knew you did too, so so glad that we're all here, and uh, boy, God's been good to I don't know if global warming's happening or not, but I like warm Januaries, so whatever that is. <laughs> uh, it's good. It's, it's a great day to be with the Lord's people. We're continuing in the provocative series, and you know, there's this this series has some real intentionality behind it. If you have a bulletin, uh, just look at that. And then in, within that, we've gone back up to the full-size bulletin. You know, since our tithing went up, we were able to get the bulletin back up to full size. I'm just kidding. Tithing didn't go up. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but the, we're back to that because we do have some uh, discussion stuff in there. And, and so I really hope that you will look that over. And I know how it is, right? We're all inundated with information and stuff. And just one more thing, we can't even sandwich it in. But what we do hope is, is that you will maximize this time because you're investing, you know, um, in the case of Jason, 35 minutes, and in my case, 45 to 50 minutes, and in listening to a talk. And, and we want you to get the most out of it. And so there's some discussion material in there. And if you'll see, there's an impetus kind of behind this particular message. Uh, what it is that we see in culture that that needs to be addressed, and it's this idea that there are there are strong um, intellectual arguments against the Christian faith, and and I just I, I want to just acknowledge that yeah, there's some of those some of those objections are are very convincing and they're and they're strong, and I, I think to minimize that, it's not fair to us, it's not fair to the people who have those objections, um, and so they're there. How we react to those objections will determine the future of, of Christianity as it's expressed in the West and in, in, uh, here in Arkansas and in the U.S. in general. And so we, we have to be very critical of ourselves as we go into something like this because it's so easy to get polarized and to push back and to, and to retreat in some sort of a orthodoxy that we, that we believe is essential uh, without being critical of, of really how we need to hear those who may be our detractors. And so that's, that's kind of what's behind this particular session on um, is dogma for dummies. Um, so uh, we'll jump right into it. And uh, there's a, whoops, give me a, give me a bigger screen, will you there? That'd be awesome. Okay, that's pretty good. Let's see if I can get it. Whoa, hey you, there we go. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's ever seen the show House. Um, Gregory House is, a, is an atheist. I don't know if Hugh Laurie is. He probably is. He plays the, the part pretty well, but he's an atheist, nihilist, and um, very interesting character, uh, fun to watch. But uh, he had this saying one time as he's struggling with people with, with religious faith, and he says, if you could reason with religious people, there would be no religious people. And, uh, and so that's the thinking that's kind of out there in the world, and, and especially among academics. I mean, you know, let's just be fair that, that, that there are fewer uh, orthodox evangelical believers among people in the academy, people with advanced degrees than there are, uh, maybe people who are more of the rank and file, uh, like myself and, and many of you. And so let's just be fair about that and say that. And so here's House, and he studied the human body, and, and all of that is a fictitious character, but still there's some, there's some truth behind that. There are people who feel that way. And, uh, and that's something we need to address in our culture. We just can't hide from it. Um, and, and what it represents is a conflict that's, that's kind of going on all the time. And that's kind of the part, that's the point of this provocative series is to take those hidden conflicts and pull them up to the top where we can get at them and we can discuss them. Uh, and so the, the conflict is, is that there is a, uh, this concept, this belief is that there is a fight, in air quotes, between science and religion. Do you think most people believe that? That you could just grab a random person on the street and say, do you think that science and religion are at, at odds with each other? Most people probably would accept that, that there's some sort of a tension or conflict between science and religion. Um, it's evidenced by a debate around this time last year uh, between Bill Nye and Ken Ham. So this was big, it was highly publicized, millions of views on it. People are very interested in this, this conflict and this discussion. This has been going on for, 
you know, about 150 years now. This this kind of back and forth fight, and you know, you got the uh, scopes, scopes, monkey trial, and all of that stuff. You know, we went from creation kind of being the assumed dogma to uh, now evolution is the assumed dogma, and uh, now there are creationist groups that are hoping to get you know some creation ideals back into the schools. So you can see how uh, how things have progressed and changed over time. Um, and, and behind this is that there is a narrative that I believe every person in this room, every person in this area, uh, certainly every person who's a part of uh, higher education and the academy believes. And here's the narrative. You guys ready? Y'all ready for the narrative? The narrative is this. Once upon a time, there were a bunch of people who assumed that God created the universe. Uh, let's tell the story from the unbeliever's perspective first, okay? Here's the unbeliever's perspective. Um, Ugg the caveman was, was um, eating uh, antelope, and, um, and lightning strikes a tree. Ugg realizes that, you know, he's in danger, and he personifies this and creates for himself a god, the god of, of storms or the lightning, right? And, and for centuries, for millennia, however long, that, that Ugg and his descendants began to tell stories of these invisible beings who control the weather and, and fateful events and other things. And, and in time, religion begins to evolve into more uh, codified kind of stories that are, that are uh, canonized and told again and again, and in time that that becomes written down. Um, and, and then, you know, you have the gospel and the Judaic, Judaic religion kind of begins to take over all of the competing ideas about where we came from. Um, but everyone's equally ignorant. Everyone's equally fearful. It's just that the monotheistic religion and, and Christianity has more appeal, more coherence. And so in a Darwinian fashion, uh, it begins to beat out the other religions as the others kind of go extinct. And now here we are in the West world uh, over time you know we go and and unfortunately because the Roman Empire accepted Christianity uh, it began to decline in its intellect and its reason the classical thought lost its way and we entered into what's called the Dark Ages and, and so the medieval barber was sawing on people with a saw and causing all kinds of infections and nobody knew what the heck was going on people are making potions and poultices and turning lead into gold, and all of this stuff is happening through the Middle Ages. And then a day dawns when a guy named Charles Darwin shows up on the Galapagos Islands and begins to ask a question, and maybe we didn't come from God after all. Maybe we arose through natural processes. And, uh, and then through his observations, he... Uh, proposes the theory of natural selection, the origin of the species. He publishes the book in 1859, The Origin of the Species. Um, and now we are finally free of the ignorance and the dogma, the prescriptions of religion. That's the beginning of the scientific age. We begin to make advancements in all kinds of ways. Biology, our existence, everything is explained by this overarching view of uh, life. And as this view begins to take more real estate, religion begins to retreat into the margins. And in time, science will finally conquer all and religion will be a thing of the past. That's the narrative. Is anybody, does that resonate? Has anybody heard that narrative? Do you, you think that's out there? Of course. And from the Christian side, we're like, hey, we were doing good. <laughs> and then this Darwin jerk, you know, the devil raised up Darwin. And he made up this lie. And, and now everyone's spreading this lie because they don't want God to rule their lives. And, uh, and so there's this idea that the media and that the academy and that others are conspiring to tear down kind of the pillars of Christianity from the time of Darwin. And, uh, and that's all great and, and fine, except that it's not true. <laughs> that as early as the 7th century BC, Greek philosophers were supposing ideas of how creation started in the ocean by spontaneously generating life that crawled out onto the land and began to breathe air and grew hair and became us in the 7th century BC. 
In addition to that, um, there were thinkers in the Christian church who believed um, in, 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 a, in, a, in a kind of mechanics of creation that weren't as static as what we think of creationism being. You know, here's the thing is, is that once, if you ask someone, what's creation? What's creationism? They would say, well, it's a belief that God created everything as we see it today. Right? And, and we know that's not true. We know that species have changed. We know species have gone extinct, extinct. And so we say, well, obviously creationism is not true because everything is not as it has always been. We know that from the fossil record. Okay? But the fact of the matter is, is that the idea that everything is as it has always been did not come from the Judeo-Christian tradition. It came from Platonic thought, where Plato supposed that everything here had a corresponding essential nature in, a, in an abstract realm. You see? And so that didn't come from Christianity. Augustine said that things were created with potentiality, that God created all life, not in its ultimate form, but with potentiality. This is 5th century AD Christian thought. So the idea that we were all just ignorant and thought that everything was as it is now and will always be is completely erroneous. That's not the case. Christianity does not breed ignorance, and Darwin did not save us. Darwin's ideas had been around for centuries. He just published them, and the society was ready for it. His one contribution was the idea that natural selection, basically a random mutation, creates an advantage which allows for natural selection and species change. By the way, that particular aspect of evolution cannot be proven, has not been proven, will not be proven. They're breeding fruit flies. They're intentionally mutating them. They're hitting them with radiation to speed up their reproductive cycle. Fruit fr flies normally breed every 10 days. You can get them down to about 24 hours. You can hit them and you can hit their genetic code again and again and again. You see the equivalent, the equivalent for fruit flies since for the past hundred years since these experiments have been done to human life is about five million years. So in our observable life, we have about five million years of fruit fly evolution that we've engineered. Did you know that not a single beneficial mutation has come out of that? Not a one. So the idea that random mutations can turn, uh, you know, a dog into a dolphin is completely ridiculous since we just can't prove that that, that process would do it. So that's the one thing that Darwin contributed, and yet there's really no proof that that could or does ever happen. There does seem to be potentiality, though. There does seem to be the ability of life to flex and to bend as the need is there. Isn't that impressive? If I could come up with technology, you know, if, you, if I invented a broom handle that would just get to be like 10 feet long every time I needed to poke a wasp nest out of the, out of the eaves and then it would shrink back down to about this big when I needed to clean off my steps, right? And then it would turn into a club when I was under attack. I mean, if I could invent something that would morph like that, you'd be impressed, wouldn't you? And yet we look at the, those kinds of changes in life and we go, wow, what a random chance thing. Have we lost our minds? I think we have. You see, Christians have been pioneers in science. Let me show you something. Uh, Darwin published The Origin of the Species in 1859. This man, Gregor Mendel. He discovered genetics in roughly the same year. Darwin believed that genetics were passed through some particles that sloughed off of the cells called gemmules. And that gemmules carried not only inherited traits, but it carried your life experience. So if you work out real hard and you, and you get real strong and, you, and then you have a baby, your baby will be strong. That's what Darwin believed how genetics worked. And if you study real hard and you get real smart and you have a baby, he's going to be smarter. 
That's how Darwin believed genetics worked. You know who got genetics right? Gregor Mendel. Did you know something about Gregor Mendel's clothes? See, we weren't a bunch of idiots thinking that, that somehow we're, you know, this sky god's going to save us from ourselves. We were curious. We were ready for answers, and Gregor Mendel started mixing and breeding peas and stuff and discovering that dominant recessive traits, people ignored him and dismissed him. They listened to Darwin instead. It wasn't until the early 1900s that people rediscovered that Mendel was right the whole time. George Washington Carver. This man would go into his study and seek the Lord over creation. He told the story in one of his lectures. He said, he said Mr. Creator, what was the universe made for? And God responded. And he said, little man, you asked for too much. You couldn't understand the answer. He said, well, well then, Mr. Creator, what, what was man made for? And God said, little man, you still ask for too much. Cut your request down and clarify your intentions. So George Washington and Carver says, Mr. Creator, what was the peanut made for? God says back, he says, you know, you're getting closer, but it's still infinite. Ask some more. Ask something else. What do you want to do with the peanut? He says, Mr. Creator, can I turn the peanut? Can I make milk out of a peanut? God says, what kind of milk? Good old Jersey milk or just plain old boarding house milk? In three days, George Washington Carver discovered 360 uses to the peanut, including plastics, synthetics, recipes. You see, one discovery with one weed, it revolutionized the South. It raised the standard of living of poor black sharecroppers who were living after the Civil War. It revolutionized science and our understanding of how the world works. It changed our view of how we treat our environment. You see, this one man who loved the Lord in three days brought harmony from black to white, from science to religion, from industry to ecology, because he loved Jesus. You think Christianity breeds ignorance? I don't think so. Richard Dawkins thinks so. He published a book called The God Delusion, where he talks about how we're a bunch of fools. And he says that people who believe uh, in God just can't possibly see the world as it is. That, uh, that the truth of evolution and that the overwhelming evidence of science is such that you really have to stick your head in the sand uh, to continue to be a religious person. And so he's on a crusade to kind of tear down uh, Christianity. He published his book, um, I think, in 2006 or 2007. In the exact same year, this man published another book. It's called The Language of God. This man is Francis Collins, the decoder of the human genome. Nobel laureate. And what Francis Collins discovered is, is that to make one human being, you need three billion lines of code. Do you know how much three billion lines of code is? If you print that in 12-point font on 8.5 by 11 paper, you stack that paper up, you will have a stack of paper as tall as the Washington Monument. It's information. Does information ever self-generate? You see, he says that at essence, the world is made of information, and information comes from a mind. So what's behind our existence is a mind. There's a Christian who's done more for the advancement of the humanity than Richard Dawkins will ever do. You see, here's the real conflict. The science versus religion conflict is imaginary. There is no conflict. See, because Francis Collins doesn't have a problem living in both worlds. George Washington Carver didn't have a problem living in both worlds. You know, Gregor Mendel had no problem living in both worlds. And because they lived in both worlds, the world is better. But here's the real conflict. It's naturalism. You see, the idea of science is, is, it should be belong to all of us. But the supposition that if I can't measure it or observe it, it doesn't exist, is complete folly. It doesn't follow. 
from the idea that measuring and observing is important, right? If I could say, you know, beef brisket is the best food in the world, that's fine. If I say beef brisket's the only food in the world, I'm insane. And it's the same with scientific method. Really, like, this scientific method is wonderful. It's helped us. It's when we start thinking it's the only game in town that we've gone out of our nut. It's naturalism. This is Bertrand Russell. I want to share with you his teapot analogy. Many orthodox people speak as though it were the business of skeptics to disprove received dogmas, rather than dogmatists to prove them. This is, of course, a mistake. If I were to suggest that between the Earth and Mars there's a China teapot revolving about the Sun in an elliptical orbit, nobody would be able to disprove my assertion, provided I were careful enough to add that the teapot is too small to be revealed even by our most powerful telescopes. But if I were to go on to say that since my assertion cannot be disproved, it is an intolerable presumption of the part of human reason to doubt it, I should rightly be thought to be talking nonsense. If, however, the existence of such a teapot were affirmed in ancient books, taught as the sacred truth every Sunday, and instilled in the minds of children at school, hesitation to believe in its existence would entitle the doubter to the attention of a psychiatrist in an enlightened age, or of the inquisitor in an earlier time. I cannot, therefore, think it is presumptuous to doubt something which has long been held to be true, especially when this opinion has only prevailed in certain geographical regions, as is the case with all theological opinions. My conclusion is that there is no reason to believe any of the dogmas of traditional theology, and further, that there is no reason to wish that they were true. Why are you not a Christian? Because I see no evidence whatever for any of the Christian dogmas. I've examined all the stock arguments in favor of the existence of God, and none of them seem to me to be logically valid. So, uh, Russell's belief is, and I think it's important for us to notice this, he's saying that just because you were taught this as a kid, just because lots of people agree with you on it, just because it goes back to ancient texts does not mean it's automatically true. Okay? And, and his claim is, is that the burden of proof is on the Christians. It's on the religious people, not on the atheists. That the atheists are by default correct until Christians can prove the existence of God. Um, well, I just thought of an analogy for this. This is a picture of Mars, a uh, Mars rover. And, and what if we got back, you know, some of these pictures of Mars? And, and we're looking at them, and we're panning across, and we're zooming. And, uh, and as, we, as we zoom across the landscape, we run into something like that. Now, I'm not of the opinion that there's extra, extraterrestrial life, uh, at least intelligent extraterrestrial life. That's not my opinion. I know that there are a lot of people, especially atheists, who, would, who are straining their eyes to find some sort of extraterrestrial life. Now, if we saw that, upon whom is the burden of proof that there's extraterrestrial life or not? Well, see, those who believe in extraterrestrial life have some good reason to say they believe in it, don't they? But I don't really agree with that. I could say, well, I don't see any extraterrestrials. You can say, well, they're very small, or they're not there right now. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's convenient. See, the fact that we're here, I think it, it nullifies Bertrand Russell's uh, problem in the sense that, that the burden of proof is on someone to tell us how such fine design could possibly exist without a designer. I believe that's where the burden of proof lies. For if I were to tell someone, well, that's just erosion. That's just wind and, and currents. And, you know, Mars has been there. I mean, Mars has been there for almost 5 billion years. Did you know that? 
And the soil is very pliable. I mean, we've, we've been taking studies and we see that the soil can really move around. You know, would you think I was being reasonable if I said that just appeared by natural processes? Why is it that we, well, we would even validate a scientist who says that, that this, I mean, that's just a facsimile of this, right? That can't move or think or anything. And yet somehow people believe that this happened by blind chance. And so I, I think the burden of proof is there. And it just goes to show that there is a belief system that's completely irrational, naturalism, that's made up by highly rational people. But here's the other side, and, and it's versus literalism. I'm just trying to find a better word for it. Um, uh, literalism would be a naive approach to Scripture that thinks that everything that I read means what I think it means on the first reading. Okay? That, that if I read it and it seems to me to be saying X, then that's what it means. That's what, the, that's what the writer meant. You see how arrogant that is? That, that somehow I'm, I'm divorced from that context by thousands of years, and I can just dictate backward what it meant without doing the study and the research and trying to see it from, through the eyes of those who were in that situation. This is literalism. Let me give you an example. So we picked on Bertrand Russell, right? Now we're going to pick a little on Martin Luther. By the way, I, I just want to tell you, I'm not really sharing my position per se. I want to give you uh, a little bit wider parameters today. Okay. So uh, Christians believe things all over the spectrum. And I think people who love Jesus and are going to heaven believe stuff all over the spectrum about our origins. And I know that there are many people who think, well, it's just got to be this. But I want us to widen out a little bit. Okay. So here's the thing Martin Luther said, and you may not be able to read that, so I'll read it to you. He says, when Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, then let this period continue to have been six days. And do not venture to devise any comment according to which six days were one day. But if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. Which is a great point, right? And Martin Luther said, you know, it says six days. That must be six days, right? Um, but Martin Luther also said this. He says, people give ear to an upstart astrologer who strove to show that the earth revolves not the heavens or the firmament, the sun and the moon, um, the sun and the moon. Whoever wishes to appear clever must derive some new system, which of all systems is, of course, the very best. This fool wishes to reserve the entire science reverse the entire science of astronomy, but sacred scripture tells us that Joshua commanded the sun to stand still and not the earth. Uh -oh. <laughs> Does anyone, did you come in here today thinking that the sun goes around the earth? Nobody did? But didn't you read it where it said Joshua commanded the sun to stand still? That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Then you read where it says that God put the stars in the sky, that he created a dome over the earth, and that he set these lights in the sky? Didn't you read that in the Bible? Now, why is it that you read those things and don't automatically have a problem with the idea of the sun or the earth going around the sun? Is it possible that sometimes what we're confronting is our own interpretation rather than what the Bible means to say? Is that possible? That the problem isn't with the Bible at all? I mean, you say, well, well, that's convenient. Everybody thought the earth was created in six literal days until scientists and astronomers started saying it was billions of years old. Now you're changing your story. Right? And I want to admit that that's not fair to be able to change your story later. It's not. But I think what, what people who are ultra-literal with the Bible do, unfortunately, is very similar to what the naturalists do, and that is that they turn away from a source of knowledge. 
Romans 1, 18 through 20, it says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since cr the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. I don't believe that God is ever happy when people suppress knowledge. If our belief system cannot take us into every realm of exploration, it's too weak. We obviously don't believe it. I believe God wants us to not suppress knowledge. Yes, the atheists, the naturalists are suppressing knowledge. They're excluding the Bible. They're excluding Christian experience, the experience of the church. They're excluding that from consideration. And God says, I, I condemn that. But I believe that sometimes there's an element in the church that says, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to know that. I want to stay over here. Things are easy. And we're going to have to come out of that shell, folks. It's coming to us. <laughs> we're going to have to be a little more a little more intentional about what we believe. And so in Psalm 19, it says this, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Jump down to verse uh, seven. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. Statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. God has given us two books. He's given us the book of creation of nature. And he's given us his revelation through scripture. We dare not pit those against each other. That the exploration of nature is an exploration of who God is. And it, should we ever try to inhibit the exploration of the natural world, we will have committed an offense against God, I believe. We need to hear both. Jesus heard both. He said this, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spend. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. You see how he's weaving nature and scripture together. He's referencing Solomon. And then he's saying, look at those birds. You see, he's, he's talking about the nature of humanity. And, and, and then he's saying, you know, look at those flowers. That we have to be attentive to what God is saying to us through creation. And I believe that science can help us in that way if we'll let it. Hugh Ross says this, truth by definition is information free of contradiction and error. One revelation of God's truth cannot be held as inferior or superior to another. It can be different, just as the content of Ezra is different from that of Romans. But truth cannot be better or worse. Thus, when science appears to conflict with theology, we have no reason to reject either the facts of nature or the Bible's words. Rather, we have reason to re-examine our interpretations because the facts of nature and scripture will always agree. So are Christians going back and, and redacting their message because scientists have discovered things? Nope. Origin. Born in 18, or 184. <laughs> 184 AD says this, Now what man of intelligence would believe that the first and the second and third day of the evening and morning existed without the sun, moon, and stars? Did Origen believe that Genesis 1 was saying six literal days? Now, I'm not saying you can't believe that. I'm, I'm not saying that science won't eventually reveal that that's the case. I'm saying that Christians throughout the centuries have wondered that there have been people before Darwin ever came on the scene who looked just at the text and said, wait a minute, there was a day before there was a sun? Just maybe Genesis 1 isn't trying to tell us that. But I'm saying what I want to do is just bring out that maybe it's our interpretations that are the problem. Let's go back even earlier to right around the time of Jesus. A Jewish philosopher named Philo of Alexandria says, It is quite foolish to think that the world was created in six days or in space and time at all. Why? Because even every period of time is a series of days and nights. 
And these can only be made by su made such by the movement of the sun as it goes over and under the earth. You can see his astronomy wasn't quite there. <laughs> but the sun is part of heaven. I was typing that. So the, the time is confessedly more recent than the world. It would therefore be correct to say that the world was not made in time, but the time was formed by means of the world. That makes sense. For it was heaven's movement that was in the index of nature of time. When Moses says he finished his work on the sixth day, we must understand him to be adducing not the quantity of days, but of a perfect number, namely six. So it's not like Christians are being forced. So if you know an old earth creationist, don't rag on them. Don't tell them they're just listening to Darwin. <laughs> These people have been around for, for millennia. But there may be something to this. And what I'm asking is, is could you put your interpretation up for scrutiny? You see, both of these positions are in retreat in our society today. Pure naturalism will not stand further scientific investigation. It can't. That's why we have militant atheism. That's anytime someone's having a crisis of faith, they get militant. Literalism, if science continues in the direction it is, will continue to wane. That's just the facts. They're both in retreat, but uh, I believe that there is something we can do to go forward together. There, I think there are three things. The first one is, is we, need, we just need to know where to draw lines. Jesus says this, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. You see, I think many people, and I know this has been true in my past, who claim to be Christians are not Christians at all, we're bibliolaters. That we think that somehow our faith consists of the line-by-line -line words in a book, as opposed to this book being an instrument to point us to a, to a Savior. Because the throne of God is unmoved. And that the Bible's function is to serve as the most perfect, beautiful instrument, along with nature, to point us to the transcendent. And you know what? It does it beautifully. Without fail, it fulfills its function in a way that no human could have ever devised. You want to know how good a telescope is? Don't scrutinize the nuts and bolts and lenses. Look through the end. See, because that's what Scripture's for. It's not a science manual. It's not a history book. It's an instrument to lead us to the living Son of God who created us. That's where we draw the line. Who is Jesus? This is where they drew the line in the first century church in 2 John. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is a deceiver and the Antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. That's where the line's drawn. It's not drawn on how we meet on Sunday or how we worship God. It's not drawn on our interpretation of any particular passage of the Bible. It's drawn on who is Jesus to you. And that leaves lots of room for questioning and wondering and exploration. It's who is Jesus. So we need to know where to draw the lines. The second thing we need to do is just we need to worship God with our minds. Folks, the secular sacred divide is a poison. It's a cancer. This idea that you engage your mind when you go to work and when you go to school, when you come to church and you just kind of go slack-jawed. The idea that Christianity is something that's told to you or infused into you rather than something you take hold of and wrestle with is wrong. We have to take hold of it. We have to wrestle with 
age, Matthew 22, 35 through 38. One of them, an expert of the law, tested him with this suggestion, teacher, this question, teacher, which is the greatest command in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Did you know that with all your minds, not in the original Shema in Deuteronomy 6, 5, that Jesus was in a, is, was in a Greco-Roman world where the intellect was separated from the heart. And Jesus wanted to make sure that people understood that your mind has to be turned on if you're going to love God. You can't sit there and receive and let someone do the chewing for you. It won't work. This is the first and greatest commandment. If we don't get that, we've missed the rest. George Washington Carver says this, reading about nature is fine, but if a person walks in the woods and listens carefully, he can learn more than what is in the books, for they speak with the voice of God. It's an engagement. It's paying attention. Mind. Timothy Keller says this, a faith without some doubts is like a human body without any antibodies in it. People who blithely go through life too busy or indifferent to ask hard questions about what they believe as they do, about why they believe as they do, will find themselves defenseless against either the experience of tragedy or the probing questions of a smart skeptic. A person's faith can collapse almost overnight if she has failed over the years to listen patiently to her own doubts, which should only be discarded after long reflection. You see, Jesus calls me to leave behind my security, to leave behind my plans, to forsake my possessions and everything that people are striving for in this world and to trust him. But you know what? I can't trust him on baseless claims. I can't trust him on, on just pure, just blind, unreasonable propositions. He loves me enough. He loves me enough. Not to prove, not to have any refutable proof, but to give me something that my mind can get a hold of. See, I've had to wrestle. You need to wrestle. Because if we don't wrestle, we'll settle into some costless religion. I want a happy family. I want a community around me. I want to go to heaven if there is one. Right? That's not the Christian faith. The Christian faith is forsake it all. Die to yourself. It better be true. <laughs> And we have to go through the trouble of wrestling through these questions or we'll never have the faith that will put it all on the line. We have to do it. And the final thing is, is dialogue with skeptics. Folks, we cannot retreat. They never did in the first century. And we shouldn't either. Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 18. While Paul was waiting for them in Harvard, Remember that? And he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of a bunch of arrogant skeptics. <laughs> but you know where I'm going, right? And he says, so he reasoned in the synagogue with both the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks as well as in the marketplace day by day. What did he do? Browbeat? Picket? Yell slogans across the street? Take out ad spot? Throw some tracts out there. Reasoned. Question and answer and thinking. He reasoned with the philosophers. Stoic, Epicureans and Stoic philosophers. He began to debate with them. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They finally take him. They take him to the... Areopagus, where they can have a conversation with them about this more. It says, and Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I uh, realized that you should open to Romans chapter 6, read verse 23. See, the, the, the skeptics don't believe the Bible. You can't use the Bible to prove the Bible. <laughs> he says, I looked around and I saw your culture. And I saw God. He says, I found an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. 
You see, we are in a unique place in time where science has begun to converge with Scripture. This is what a blast pattern looks like. This is off a of Mercury comet or whatever hits. This is what a blast pattern looks like. Okay, uh, scientists say the universe came from a Big Bang. Does that look any different? You see, there's nothing at the middle. It's not a blast pattern. It's not an explosion. The universe was pulled into place from outside. This is science. It's called cosmic inflation. It arrived at its current location in a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. <laughs> Does that sound like in the beginning God said to you? I don't have to go to Genesis 1 to get there. This is a large hadron collider. When I was a kid in school, I was taught that matter is eternal. It can't be created. It can't be destroyed. And you know what? If matter is eternal, it gives lots of time for us to have gotten here by random chance. What the Large Hadron Collider has showed us that, light, that not only is matter not eternal, it's not really essentially even here. That when you blast matter down to its smallest part, you know what you get? Matter dust? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> so you want to be a materialist? Guess what? Your God is nothing. You know what theologians have been saying for the long millennia? God created all things out of nothing. This is a cell. You know, when, um, when Darwin supposed his theory, he actually theorized that there would be things called cells. For Darwin, cells look like a Lego block, right? They're about as complex as a Lego block. And so you just, and you can just reorganize and come up with any kind of animal you want just by changing the configuration of the Lego blocks. But unfortunately for Darwin, is, is we discovered that a cell is a whole universe made of machinery, made out of proteins, and we have not yet been able to even generate one in a lab. And that every one of these mechanics has to be there for the cell to live. That you can't slowly grow a nucleus. You can't slowly get a cytosol. All of these things have to be there or the cell dies. And if the cell dies, it doesn't grow. And if it doesn't grow, it doesn't reproduce. And if it doesn't reproduce, it doesn't evolve, which means that you can't have evolution. It's like a Rube Goldman machine. You see, if you take one of these blocks out, the machine falls apart. This cannot happen through slow incremental changes over time. It has to be here in toto, or it's not here at all. This is what science is telling us today. You see how crazy naturalism is. But when we come to the end of the day, the skeptic will not be convinced by arguments. We have to give them. They have to undergird what we're saying. We can't expect him to leap into the complete unknown. What sounds to him like a fable. But at the end of the day, it's this. Very truly, I say to you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will provide, prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. About judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. The fact of the matter is, is that every person, atheist, skeptic, Christian, has sinned. And they know it. And at the end of the day, that's where we come. <laughs> it's a message of the gospel. It's a message of the one thing that plagues us most. Sin. And how it can be set free. How we can be set free from it. This is the universe, the observable universe. 93 billion light years across. Every one of these little dots is not a planet, it's not a star, it's not a galaxy. It's a cluster of millions of galaxies. <laughs> you're right there. You're, you're smaller than the smallest micro, my, microscopic organism right now from that perspective. You think we got it figured out? See, Martin Luther thought the universe was just a tapestry folded over this little terra firma. <laughs> and for him, it was challenging to think that it could be bigger, but, but how big is our God? <laughs> how big is our God? You see, there's so much to know, so much to explore. And if we really believe that God is who he says he is, everything we get to know will cause us to worship him that much more. We don't have to be afraid of a thing. So that's the... That's the message for this morning. 
Everyone's got a dogma. Ours is to the test of time. Ours cannot be destroyed. We've already proven that. And now science is swinging back our way. So go take advantage of it. 